This morning I had planned to do a final message from the book of James, how we're not to leave from the the book of James unchanged in how we think and how we speak and in dealing with sin like anger in our lives or just being doers of the word and not hearers only. And I felt led this week to to move that out a week with all that's been going on this this week and in recent days in our lives and in our church family. Last Sunday night I was at Emmanuel Baptist and I spoke on Psalm chapter 46 and I felt God's blessing and leading and some encouraging from fellow leaders to bring us that message today. So if you would turn to Psalm 46, this has been taught here before, this is a familiar psalm, but I I pray that these words would come to us with freshness and like never before impacting us in our lives. I've read this passage recently at hospital bedside. These, these words have come to mind and shared those with, with those who have been going through suffering. And there's people even in this next week or two that have things that are on their hearts right now that are very, very notable and, and where there's strength that we need. And this, I talked last week about how we need strength. We need to ask others for help and prayer in troubled, troubled times. Psalm 46 shows us who we can ask for prayer, who and and where our ultimate strength is found, and who this God is we pray to when we are anxious, fearful, and when we are in unstable times. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of The Most High, God, is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our fortress. We pray. Our great God, we are those who are in need of being reminded of who you are and who we are in light of that. And that you are this God that we read of here and this God who is with us if we trust in you and know that you are God. Lord, even as I was Speaking with a brother already this morning about a prayer burden on his heart, being reminded that you are the one we need to look to and trust. Is talking with another brother just about how much there's going on in our, our world and how caught up we can get into it. And we need to look above this world to the one who is ruling and reigning and whose voice is sovereign. 
I pray, Lord, you would give strength to us, to your people, and that you would help us now, through your Son and your Spirit, to be encouraged, to be lifted up, to, have, to be changed in some way as we consider who you are. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In your note sheet, there's an outline if this will help you follow along. But the, the first part of this passage, the first three verses, shows us that God is our immovable refuge. God is our immovable refuge. He says it this way in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved. In other words, there's a contrast. God is our immovable refuge. Even if everything else moves, even if the mountains could be moved, he is unmoved. One translation says, when mountains crumble into the sea, it even makes me think of a song, when things tumble and fall or the mountains should crumble to the sea, I won't be uh, afraid. That There's a, a, a greater way for us who, who know God to know if he's with us. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to fear. One translation says, even though the earth be changed. There's a lot of things that are changing on this earth. There's a lot of things in this world that have even changed. Even in this last year, even in 2021, there's things that continue to change that can tempt us to be fearful. There's concerns, and some of you are here, you have concerns with things in the very near future in, in your life, uncertainty, instability. There's concerns, of course, about health and and some of the things that people were counting on before have changed. There's things that can tempt us to, to fear. Concerns for mental health as well and, and spiritual health in these times that we live in. Also, conservative views are under attack, especially in areas of sexuality and morality and things that are important to us in our families. And they're under attack not by conversation in a lot of cases, but by cancellation. There's communist and Marxist and socialist ideas that are on all levels of our society and, and education. And choice is a concern for many. Choice that's being taken away in our free society where less and less you're able to make educated choices on risks you take or in certain areas or even get to vote on certain things or even get to debate. Many choices are now made for us by unelected officials. And those are things that can cause concern and, and even fear and even concerns on personal health decisions being taken away, ironically at times by people who say they are pro-choice for what a, a woman would do for a life in, inside of her. They don't want to give a choice, some of them, for what she would put into her own body. And convictions are, are putting some people on, on the line, some on the, on the front lines who are being forced to set aside conscience or concerns for health and being told basically they need to comply or goodbye. We've seen Christian worship in North America, like ways we would have never imagined last year being the point of having pastors in prison in North America, up in Canada, not just the ones you've heard about before, but Pastor Tim Stevens also, as they were meeting out in a field and helicopters came and found them, and then the next day there were police at his doorstep with his eight kids as he's hugging them, and they're taking him away to, to jail for weeks, and he's, he's now out, and some of that is is still going on in the court system up there, but ways we would have never dreamed before. Things have changed, even here in North America, but we could think of also censorship, how much even this year we've seen more and more of that. And these are things that make people fearful and concerned. I mean, from the, some of the most powerful people 
being permanently censored from social media or an Amazon book on the transgender movement that was mentioned last weekend at the, at the conference that was banned, or, or Twitter locking focus on the family not that many weeks ago, and, and sermon clips from pastors we've all benefited from that have been banned on the YouTube platform, and there's even controversy about the last Saturday's conference that was here as it was taken down off, so, off, and there's still some questions as to why there was a, originally a copyright violation and then uh, there was a content violation, trying to find clarity from YouTube as to, as to what that was all about. But there's more and more of these things swirling around and, and, and even sometimes common sense and, and critical thinking. It seems like things are, are slipping away. I was talking with a brother this morning. says, as you read the language of the psalm, it says, even if mountains slip into the sea, it seems that things that we thought were solid and sure before, it seems like they're eroding away and some of them slipping away. And, and we start to think we're in, we're, we're in trouble and we need, to, we need to hear this psalm about who is our help in trouble. And we need to not let those things consume us. And, and I want to specifically urge you not to let those things consume even your conversations here with God's people. But we need to be consumed with, we, we know this is going on, we need to be consumed with a bigger vision of who God is and who is our strength, who we can count on, what we know will not change, even if things continue to change. The, the sky is not falling, but even if the mountains were falling, we have an unfailing refuge. Even if the earth be changed, and, and it is going to continue to change until the end. We have an unchanging God, amen? And, and I want to encourage you, if you think about the future, or finances, or family, or whatever it is that might tempt you to fear here this morning, Psalm 46 was written so that God's people could say in light of this, therefore we will not fear, and it has to do with God's character. It doesn't have to do with our convenience or how we would like things to go. We're actually reminded in this psalm that we're not in control. We're not in charge, but there is someone who is, and he's good. And the world's not in control. It likes to, some people like to think maybe they are, but they're not either. We need to point people to the one who is in control. But if you're one of those who doesn't feel like you have the strength at times to face all that is going on, all that seems to be giving way, verse 1 says, God is our strength. And when all around our soul gives way, He is our immovable refuge that stays. He is our solid rock. I was thinking about that expression, between a rock and a hard place. You've all heard that, right? We're, we don't know which way to choose. We're in between a, a rock and a, and a hard place. Well, the Psalms show us that God is our rock that we turn to in any hard place. Which, which way are we going to go? We're going to go, the Psalms say, to the, the rock of ages. We're going to cling to him as our, as our refuge. He's the one who's going to give us strength. In times of trouble. Another image would be, he's our refuge, he's our shelter in the sense of we, we, we go there to find shelter in a time of storm. Or if we think of rocks crashing from the waves, there, there's this solid rock that the waves may be swirling around it, but that rock is not, is not moving. You, you've seen that, and it, it says the waves roar and foam and they swell. And it's as if the land trembles before it, and we see what's going on in our land, and we can tremble at times, be fearful, and maybe be tempted to just withdraw when that's not what this psalm would call us to. But we see the turmoil not only in our land, but in our own hearts. We see people raging, we see people roaring at each other in disagreements and debates, I don't know if you ever watch on TV, they have two different sides, and they're just, it just seems like they're just yelling, and they're just roaring. It's not very edifying at all, but it's almost like they're like about to foam at the mouth because is there disagreements, but there's a lot swirling in, in the world, in, in the media, social media, that I think we, 
good for a lot of us just to turn it off and to be still and to know who God is. There's waves of information. There's waves of misinformation. And it's harder and harder for people to, to trust, to, to be sure. I mean, can we be sure? A lot of people are wondering that, maybe who didn't even before. And when people tell us certain things, how do we know we can trust them? Psalm 46 tells us that when God tells us something, we can know, we can be sure, we can be confident. We can trust him because he's immovable, he's immutable. That means he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But this language of, of waves in verse 3 is also used of waves of emotion. If you're in Psalm 46, just go back to Psalm 42. I want you to see how this language of waves is used in the Psalms. He's Psalm 42, verse 3, saying, My tears have been my food day and night. In other words, he's been consumed by his emotions. While they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? He says in verse 5, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. But then he says he's cast down in verse 6. And then verse 7, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. He feels these waves, these breakers, these, these emotions. Are just, they keep coming. It's like the tide going in and out. And that's how it is sometimes with, with suffering. But he says to himself again in verse 11, Why are you cast down, O my soul? He's preaching to himself. And why are you in turmoil within me? This is what we need to say to our, our soul. Hope in God. I shall yet praise him, my hope and my salvation and my God. This is what's going on in Psalm 46. In fact, Psalm 46 was actually written to be sung, but it says to the choir master. So, this is for the choir. He's, he's preaching to the choir, if you will. But he's, he's also teaching God's people how to preach to themselves. To say, the, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Just these last two weeks, the truths of this psalm, I think I've seen at work among us and, and so needed among us just two Sundays ago, as you know, if you were here, as we were coming back from camp, we had heard Robin Haller's mom passing away and Kevin Griffin, Kathy's husband, and Max and Brittany and their family all within a short amount of time. And that same day, on the way out of church, a sister told me of a dear family member who had passed away in another state and another one that same time that had passed away. Someone else, I learned that same weekend, had had a, a nephew in another state who, who died in a, in a horrible way. And just these last couple of weeks and even just since last Sunday, two of our dearest and longest term Members of our church have, have gone on to glory, which is a glorious thing for them, but it, for those who are left behind, for their family. There are times when those waves of emotion, those, those sorrows like sea billows roll, and they're going to continue to roll, and, and we need to continue to, to minister and to be with those people in these weeks and months ahead, not just until memorial times, but in these times ahead, this is a, a time for us to be reminded and to be re-strengthened and recommitted to strengthen each other with these truths like this psalm, that God is our refuge, that God is our strength, but he's with us and, and we need to be with each other as God's people because he's with us through his people. But we don't need to fear, because God has willed, as the old hymn says, his truth to triumph through us. Even when our body is killed, his truth abideth, abideth still. His kingdom is 
forever. That's what Luther wrote meditating on this psalm, which was, his, I think, one of his favorite psalms, if not his favorite. Speaking of God's word that's above all earthly powers. So we don't even tremble for our enemy. We trust the God of Jacob. He's our refuge. That means he's a stronghold. There's these old, in, in Europe, maybe if you've been there, you've seen these old castles who have these, these defensive walls or, or towers built around them to, to keep it safe. And the idea of those walls, and a lot of them are still standing from hundreds of years ago or even a millennia ago. But God is... Our bulwark is another word for that. He's our, he's our wall that will never fail, never needs to be repaired. He's a mighty fortress. He's like a, a castle, a high, safe place that would keep you safe in the midst of any flood. He's our impenetrable defense. He's our indestructible rock. He's our high and strong tower. He's solid. He's stable. He's certain. And he's our strength. Our refuge and our strength. This is his power, especially in protecting and preserving his people. Let me just read from a couple other psalms. Psalm 61, verse 2, from the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. What do you do when your heart's overwhelmed with emotion? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter. That's the same word from Psalm 46. Verse 1, you've been a shelter for me, a strong tower for my enemy. Psalm 62, the next one, God only is my rock and my salvation. In other words, he's the only one we're to look to for this. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge. That's the same word, but this just fills out the picture of what he's talking about. My refuge is in God. Here's what he says, Psalm 42, trust in, or Psalm 46, Trust in him at all times. Psalm 62, verse 6, verse 8, actually. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So pour out your heart to him. Look to him. Turn to him. Ask him to, to lead you to what's higher and more dependable than you in those times when you need that, which you will, and which I've needed, and which many here have needed, even since the last Sunday. He's very present. He's very near is the idea. He's always at hand. And he's there, especially in trouble. He's our help in times of trouble. One of the truths of the Psalms, one of the ways we get that help in trouble is through God's word. So Psalm 119, it's all about the word of God. The very second to the last verse, he says, help me through your, or he says, your word, your ordinances help me. And as you read Psalm 119, you see how you see that happen within the psalm, how his word continually helped him as he goes through the ups and downs, sometimes feeling like he's in the dust or he's, 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 he's lowly, he needs to be revived. I think ten times he prays that God would revive him. Psalm 119 would be a great psalm to look for that kind of help. But here in Psalm 46, verse 2, the application of knowing this first point, he's an immovable refuge, is therefore we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and it's interesting because the heading of this psalm says this is by the sons of Korah. If you know the story of Korah in the book of Numbers, some of his rebellious descendants, their, their ancestors before them, actually rebelled against God, and the earth actually got removed, and they actually died because of their grumbling and their complaining against God. But the faithful sons of Korah that survived and that actually became musicians in Israel would have been well aware of what happened to their forefathers and their own tribe and family. But they, because they trusted in the Lord, said, we, we don't need to fear that the earth will be removed from under us. We might say today, we don't need to fear earthquakes. We don't need to fear a, a tsunami cannot wipe out God's sovereign purposes. There's no roaring or raging in creation that bothers our Creator. There, there's no earthquake that can shake His purpose. I remember for me, the, maybe I've shared this years ago, but the summer of 1993 was a, a difficult summer for me. I had 
lived in the Philippines. I came back by myself to the United States. There had been a, a relationship that I was in that had gone, that had ended. I was consumed with that. I, there was just so much change happening in my life. I didn't know where I was going to go to school or what my future held. I was away from everything that I'd known before, friends, and, and a friend wrote me a, a letter that summer. It was handwritten, and this friend wrote the words of Psalm 46, 1 through 3, out there, of a, a psalm that had been such an encouragement. And I remember reading that, and I read it again and again, how, how much of those words, and I don't think I'd ever really noticed them before, but they ministered to my soul. They gave me strength, and those words... I came to appreciate in greater depth just a few months later when I, I was in Southern California, the Northridge earthquake hit, and it hit incredibly strong where we were, so much so that the moment it hit, I didn't fear I might die. I was certain that I was going to meet my maker in just a matter of, of seconds, and I honestly wasn't sure I was right with him, and so I'm praying out, begging for him to forgive me, to save me, to be my refuge, to be my help in, in time of, of need. And in, in the aftermath of that, and actually even in the aftershocks, I, I continually kept going back to this, was reminded of this truth of Psalm 46, that if God's our refuge and strength, we don't need to fear even though the earth be moved. There's something about when the earth underneath you is moving. I, I think even people who claim to be atheists are thinking about God in those moments, and I sure was, and God was getting my attention. I actually thought maybe he was doing that for me, and... A million other people, but he, he is faithful to do that, to, to make things around us not be stable, even the things that we think are stable, so that we will trust and find our stability in him. And I remember in deeper ways, I think it was the, the 10 year anniversary of September 11, our president at the time read Psalm 46 in its entirety. I remember even noticing Psalm 46 was number one trending on a particular major internet search engine, and it was on the, that 10-year anniversary of 9-11, so it was 2011, that I was traveling back from Congo after burying my son, Mark Joseph, who had died there. And I remember on the plane going again to these truths that God is our refuge and strength. He is our very present help and so we don't need to fear even if we don't know what the future holds even if things that we thought were going to happen don't happen god is our refuge and strength and even thinking of that original 9-11 maybe some of you remember lisa beamer she wrote the book her husband todd was one of those in the pennsylvania flight who had stormed the cockpit is that plane i think was headed to the white house but they took the plane down he was one of those uh, was on the phone with his wife, and then his last words were, let's roll. And maybe you remember there was a book with that title and her testimony, but she wrote about the aftermath of, of all of this when those, when those sorrows like sea billows rolled. She had to learn how to say, be still, my soul, and know that God is God. Everything had given way in her life, and this is what she wrote, looking back on that. My faith wasn't rooted in governments, religion, tall buildings, or frail people. She said what she learned through all that is my faith and my security needed to be in God. God alone. She says, if we believe wholeheartedly each moment that our destiny rests in the hands of Jesus Christ, the one with ultimate love and ultimate power, she says, hanging on to that truth was what helped put everything else in perspective. As, as, a, as a mom who lost her, her husband, and I know this story is more familiar to a lot of you, but when Elizabeth Elliot's son, 1956, some of you remember seeing that on, on the news and on the cover of Time magazine, but her husband Jim Elliot and, and others were speared to death by the savage tribe in Ecuador. They were trying to reach with the gospel where do you go in times like that? This is where she went, Psalm 46, and here's what she wrote. Everything, I think this was from her journal, everything that has seemed most dependable has given way. Mountains are falling, it seems like. Earth is reeling. 
Some of you can even remember times like that where it just seems like things are just literally moving, it seems. In such a time, it is a profound comfort to know that although all things seem to be shaken, one thing is not. God is not shaken. And she added, the thing that's most needful to do is to be still and know that he is God and that he will be exalted. So you can even preach to your soul the words like this from the Getty hymn, Still my soul, be still and do not fear. Though winds of change may rage tomorrow, God is at your side. No longer dread those fires of unexpected sorrow. You know that if you've gone through sorrow. There's times where it's unexpected and it just hits you and you don't even know why and you become overcome with emotion. But here's the key. God, you are my God and I will trust in you and not be shaken. But Lord of peace, renew a steadfast spirit within me to rest in you alone. We need that renewed in those times. And God is our immovable Refuge, that's number one. Number two, God gives inexhaustible resources. God gives inexhaustible resources. So it's not just who he is, it's also what he gives. And we'll move more quickly through this part. But there is a river, verse 4, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. A river in those days was, was provided great resources for the people to live near the river. You think of Egypt near the Nile or the 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 Jordan River, or you think of how, how incredibly important it is to have a water source for, for life. It, it was a source of gladness in the Psalms. It was a source of stability if you had that water source. It, it even symbolized peace. We, we sing of peace like a river that can attend our way. But think about it in this context here, because the psalm starts with roaring oceans, Roaring waves, raging, troubled waters, these tumbling swells and breakers. But, but now we've got this, this stream that makes us glad. Think of Psalm 23. He, he leaves me beside streams of, of living, or I'm, I'm getting it mixed up, by, by, by the still waters even. He restores my soul. But that language of, of living water also with streams, as we see from the Old and the New Testament, it's even a, a picture of the paradise at the end of the Bible, from the beginning of the Bible. But God is the one who restores our, our souls. The streams are often fruitfulness, fullness, blessing. So these streams come out from this, this river. There's these streams that go throughout. And the original city of God in Old Testament times was, of course, Jerusalem. And there was actually a a water source. Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, it's an incredibly dry place. It's, it's very rocky, thick, huge rocks around, but there was a, there's a, a spring that's higher than Jerusalem that actually could provide a water source to them, and in the time of Hezekiah, is around 700 BC, and the tunnel is still there. 2,700 years ago, they built this tunnel King Hezekiah did. There's still the writing from that era on the wall. It's an amazing thing to, to see but there was water that could come into, right into the city. And so even some of the, the pools that are mentioned in the New Testament were fed from this water source that God had provided and, and that continues to provide these resources. But the spring continues to keep providing. But God's making a, a point here spiritually that I'm actually the one who, who provides your resources. I'm the one who provides you with stability and peace, and, and that water source actually literally helped them in times of, of war. But, but the point here, the spiritual point, verse 5, is God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. There were times for Jerusalem when it was pretty fearful. Like, imagine 185,000 Assyrians surrounding your city, their army. Jerusalem is not that big of a city. 185,000 Assyrians. And yet God, at the break of dawn, helped them. 
they went out at the brig of dawn and they saw that the angel of the Lord had come and all 185,000 of their enemies had been struck down. The point here is that we don't need to fear because God, if God is in the midst of us, if, if we are trusting him, he is sovereign, he is in control, and until our day comes, he will provide for his people. And even, even into eternity, this image of providing for his people through a stream, through a river is used. Isaiah 66 talks about giving peace like a river, being glad for Jerusalem. I think this is the new Jerusalem, an overflowing stream. Your heart will be glad. And of course, the end of the Bible, there's this stream that in the, the new world to come but here in this world, the, the point of these verses is, is there's a stability, and it's, it's in contrast to the instability of verses 2 through 3. Everything seems unstable in the first part of the psalm. But then you come to God's people aren't moved. If God's in the midst of them, you've got these mountains that are moved in verse 2, but God's city, and ultimately God's people, will not be moved. You've got the nations that rage in verse 2. Six, a little bit later, and it's actually the same word as the oceans that rage. But whether you're threatened by kingdoms or calamities or nations or nature, the, the point is the same, fear not, because we have an ever-present help. And God will help us at the break of day. We sang, great is thy faithfulness. And, and there's a, a phrase that comes out of Lamentations 3 that shows how God helps us even at the break of day. It says, morning by morning, what? New mercies I see. At the break of day, each morning, there's fresh mercies for the day. Grace, future grace, daily grace. He has mercies every morning, and we can read them every morning at the break of day. I would encourage you, if you're not reading God's word. We, we need help, and, and what a great way to start the day to, to look at his word and look for fresh mercies that you will need that very day. He's the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. Lord Sabaoth is, is the original word there. Sabaoth means he's the, the Lord of hosts. This is an army image, an almighty image. Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age, the same, he will win the battle. A mighty fortress is our God. Amen? And verse 7 says, he's with us. So this takes us to our third and final point. God is exalted as our invincible ruler. So God is our immovable refuge. God gives inexhaustible resources. But God is exalted as our invincible ruler. And we need to be reminded of, of this as well. Verse 8 Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. In other words, he's sovereign over all the, the desolations, things in this earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. He's sovereign over all those things. And wars and rumors of wars and all these things that are happening and even the the turmoil on a, on a smaller scale in our lives, but he is sovereign. He can bring desolation. He can bring desolation to an end. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He raises up kingdoms. He brings down kingdoms, Daniel said. There's nothing outside of his sovereign hand. The hearts of kings and emperors are in his hand, the proverb says, and he turns it whichever way he wishes. He's at work in, in the world and opening up judgment or, or mercy. And I think it's best to see both probably always at, at place. There's judgment in the world. There's mercy in the world. But proud nations that rage, he can bring low. But there's also, we need to think about this, there's also mercy in whatever might make us slow and still and to know who is God and that we are not, to know he's in charge and that we are not to know he's in control and that we are not and, and to know that even man's 
invisible enemy, Satan, has no power outside of God's permission and decree. He has to ask permission as he's coming to Job to, to tempt him. He has to ask, Satan has to ask the Lord permission to sift Peter like wheat. And Luther had it right. His doom is sure. Satan's doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. It's a word above all earthly powers, and it's his voice in verse 6, the Lord's voice, and we see his victory in verse 9. But here's the, the central point, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. If you're concerned about what's going on in our nation, nations around the world, we need to be... We need to remember, he is God. He will be exalted in all the nations and in all the earth. And in verse 9, he was talking about weapons of warfare. And the New American Standard in verse 10 actually has cease striving, which, which the implication could be put down your weapons. Surrender. It's, it's not just, just calm down. It's actually lay them down. Lay down your arms. Bow before God and recognize He is God. Be still before Him. Stop trying to take His place. Drop your weapons and know that He is your security and He is your victory. One writer says it's, it's, it's like cease and desist. You think of a, a parent separating two struggling children. Maybe this, this little one foolishly going after someone much much bigger, a teacher breaking up a, a fight in the, in the schoolyard, stop and be still. Let the massive truth of, of who God is hit you and his purpose in this world. And, and, and I would just say as we think about this, we need to think about ways to turn off literally everything else, including those technological things that make it so hard for us to be still. And to get time away, we talk about quiet time, but to really be still, to be quiet before our God, to, to turn off the TV and the radio, and even as times when you're maybe driving around and you're just, you just feel like you need to have perpetual noise to, to actually work, to have times of extended meditation and silence, to pray, to meditate, to look at God's word, to let these truths hit us. I was reminded as I was looking at some of the things Lisa Beamer wrote of how different people in the loss of her husband helped her with scriptures she would need to hear. It could be a simple call or a card. She felt lonely or, or help with a practical task. Um, but she said she experienced the truth of this. And I want to take it a step further as we wrap up here. And that is, as we think about God being our invincible ruler, as we look at this last section here, we need to think ultimately about God's Son. Jesus is God, but He shows us in His flesh. He shows us the Father. We, we see Him practically at work in this world. And so just looking at the language of verse 11, the, the Lord of hosts, the one who is with us, that's actually a a title for the Messiah in the, in the prophecies of Isaiah, and even that language that God is with us, that actually became a, a, not only a prophecy, but the title of Jesus in, in, the, in the New Testament, Emmanuel, God with us. And even in the Psalms, this language of refuge in verse 11 is used of God's Son. Psalm 2 is very parallel. The nations are raging in Psalm 2. The, the Lord breaks them. The Lord utters His voice. He, he warns of wrath to come in the end. And then God the Father in Psalm 2 announces His only begotten Son, and He tells the world, do homage to the Son, honor the Son, that He not become angry with you and that you not perish in the way. So like John 3.16 says, whoever believes shall not perish. The, the Psalms fill out that picture. To believe in Him is to, to honor Him so that we not perish in the way. To give him the honor, even the affection that is due him as a, as a king, like one who would fall and to, to kiss his feet. To be still before Jesus as 
God. And it says even the language of, of verse 3, there, there's a hymn that says, Be still, my soul. God undertakes to guide the future as he has the past. My, my hope, my confidence, let nothing shake. And it says this, Be still, my soul, the waves and the winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. And so that's an example of we know God is sovereign over all the winds and the waves, but Jesus actually in the flesh, while he dwelt below, he actually said to the storm, peace be still. And it was instantly that storm <sighs> became hush. Jesus has that power. This is the, the Lord Jesus, the one who is our very present strength. And even the language of, of many waters, Revelation talks about Jesus having a voice that's stronger than many waters. And Revelation even talks about how mountains will be cast into the sea and will tremble before the presence of the Lamb who is Jesus. He is the one who is telling believers throughout the Gospels, do not fear, for I am with you. He is the one who will actually make wars cease and will literally put all weapons to an end in the end. He's the one who can command. They say, who, who is this? The winds and the waves obey him. And, and we could say, who are we if we do not obey this Jesus as our Lord? And so the only way that you can have the full comfort of this psalm is as if you have made Jesus your refuge and strength. If you've trusted him as your only hope and refuge for salvation, and if Jesus is not your Lord here today, I want to urge you from the words of Scripture to cease striving in your own works to try to gain salvation because you can't. You need to know that Christ alone is the only way to God. You need to surrender to Him as your commander, as your Lord of hosts. Lay down your arms. Lay down your life and come before Him humbly as a lowly servant seeking His mercy. You need to be still and know that Jesus is God. And he will be exalted. And he will lift you up if you come to him humbly in that way. He will save you. And he will change you. And he will be your refuge and strength. These words have sustained believers throughout the centuries. I was reading of a Scottish martyr many years ago who knew he was the pastor he knew he was, this was going to be his last sermon before his congregation, before he'd be executed for his faith. And the words he chose to preach on were, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. As young men in Scotland would go to the ocean shores to ship off to world wars, they would gather and they would sing the words of this psalm from the Scottish Psalter. And Luther, even in his day, as he saw... 20 to 30 percent of people around him dying from the bubonic plague. He came to trust this psalm like never before. When there were extreme difficulties physically in his life, he would often be seen at the window singing the words of Psalm 46, and he would say to his friend Melanchthon, Come, let us sing. Let us sing the 46th psalm. We need to help each other. Come and meditate on these truths and sing these truths. And so we're going to get a chance to do that here today, to sing them together. But again, I want to encourage you as we're done with our singing to take the time where you're interacting with God's people to speak of his truth, his goodness, and his greatness over this world. Well, let's pray and then let's sing and meditate on these words together. Our great and gracious God and refuge and strength, we thank you for sending your son who shows us who you are and through your spirit who continues to change us. because Lord, we are weak people. I ask, Lord, that you would help us in our, in our weaknesses and our limitations to continue to see your unlimited and unmovable power and strength. And I want to pray specifically, Lord, for people who have things in these weeks ahead that are heavy on their hearts, Lord, that you would give them strength and that you would be more and more our fortress and that we would know you are with us, but that we would also, as your people, be with your people 
in these weeks ahead. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.